Well, look, we are in the middle of some very large scale changes. The melting of the Arctic ice cap is proceeding at a, quite frankly, a horrifying speed. Um, the destabilisation of ice shelves in the Antarctic is likewise going much too fast for comfort. We've seen the extinction of species, we're seeing rises in sea level now and the abandonment of Inuit villages and of uh, coral atolls in the Pacific. We're seeing very widespread changes in rainfall um, and what I think is quite an astonishing increase in severe weather intensity. We all know that you know, if you heat a pot of spaghetti on the stove, uh, you know, it'll get more energetic. Um, but we hadn't, scientists hadn't quite realised how much more energetic the atmosphere would get as we warmed it. So these are very ominous trends and um, we are polluting more and more every year. So the situation has become quite dangerous for humanity and uh, we need to see action in the next, I would say, one to three electoral cycles or we will have, I'm very uh, afraid, we will have lost the battle to stabilise the climate. So given that evidence, what do you say to the sceptics? They're still getting quite a bit of their time. I just think that there's probably a few percent of the population you'll never convince. There's still people who believe the Earth is flat and the moonshot never happened. Um, you just ignore them and get on with business. Do you personally know any climate sceptics who change their mind? Um, I do. It was very interesting in the US. Um, what had happened was the industry had sent representatives to talk to annual meetings of the uh, meteorologists around the US. These are people who read the weather on television. Um, and had done a very good job of snowing them with misinformation. Um, when the book came out, I had several phone calls from meteorologists who just said, thank you so much for making this clear to me. I was a sceptic before, now I know what the real situation is. Must have been fairly inspirational. It was fantastic, because those weather people do reach many, many millions of people uh, every day. So it was lovely just to see that they had been convinced by the, by the science that this was a real issue. Well, it, it's about rate of change, you see, and what's happening at the moment is a large amount of heat is being transferred into the oceans. Once that reaches a certain point, it'll become inevitable that the ice caps will melt. And once that happens, the heat balance of the entire planet will change because ice reflects sunlight into space and cools Earth, um, whereas the oceans, if the ice melts away, um, will trap sunlight and turn it into heat energy. So we have only a short, short amount of time to halt that process of that heat transfer into the oceans. Some has already happened. I think that uh, we will be in the next decade or so, if we're lucky enough to survive this period and get on the right track, we'll be working very, very hard to pull the gas out of the air um, because there's already far too much pollution in the air to allow the, the climate to, to stabilise quickly. So the window of opportunity really is probably one to three electoral cycles. You'd, you'd, you know, if we'd started 10 years ago, we may have been in a much, much better position. We definitely would have been in a much, much better position than we are today. But several governments around the world have refused to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, refused to act on the issue, and they're the anchors that are holding us back. But there is still time. There is still time. Um, there's some damage is inevitable. I do believe there is time to avert a major catastrophe, but not a lot. What does a window of opportunity mean for the average Australian, do you think? Um, the window of opportunity means that we still have a chance to leave our children a better future. Um, if, if we don't act, we will be condemning them to live in a world where there's rapidly rising oceans, um, greater damage from um, extreme weather events, different disease patterns, different rainfall patterns, and all of that's going to add up to a very stressed society, both economically and politically. And of course, we are exporting 10,000 tonnes of uranium ore a year. Some of that's made into bombs. Um, I can imagine where Australian coal and Australian uranium conspire to destabilise Earth's climate and leave us with a world full of the most dangerous weapons that humanity's ever devised. Do you think that there will be a debate about the length of the window of opportunity? I think it's too late for debate now. I think we simply need to get in and start fixing things. Um, and the fixes are so simple, they're not going to cost anyone uh, a great deal. We're simply going to have to start investing in new energy infrastructure. What we have to do is wrest control of the debate from the old dinosaur industries who want to keep on polluting and not to change. Well, look, I have my own particular views over what technologies might succeed or fail, but I don't believe they should dictate the debate. I think what we've got to do is simply get the polluter to pay and then, um, in a well-regulated free market, let the, let the free market decide what the most effective ways of generating transport fuel and, uh, and stationary electricity are. Um, very, very simple. Just put a carbon tax in place, 
let the free market and the investor uh, work out what the most viable solutions are. Do you think Australia has a role to play in exporting cleaner energy solutions? Australia has an enormous role to play. We, we are richer in alternative energy than many other countries. In fact, we'd have, I'd say we're almost uniquely blessed. We're sort of the Middle East of renewable sources of energy. We've got the world's best geothermal provinces, the world's best top uh, two or three wind provinces. We've got a huge amount of sunlight, of course, and some fantastic technology in that area. Solar thermal, solar hot water, photovoltaics. We're doing very well in all of those. Um, we have 40% a, a of the world's uranium. Um, we just we are so wealthy in all of these resources, and of course a lot of natural gas. So for low emissions sources of energy, we're incredibly well off. Well, James Hansen, who is the world's leading thinker in this area with the Goddard Institute of NASA, um, believes we're on the brink of, a, of triggering a 25 metre rise in sea level. So anyone with a coastal view from their bedroom window or kitchen window or wherever is likely to lose their house as a result of that change. So anywhere, any coastal cities, um, coastal areas are, are in grave danger. Um, we've already seen with rainfall patterns, the changing rainfall patterns, uh, the emerging danger to primary producers in eastern and southern Australia is the winter rainfall zone declines. We've seen, you know, I paid $15 a kilo for bananas recently because Cyclone Larry destroyed Australia's banana crop. Just one extreme weather event of, of um, several that we had last year. So lots and lots of people are going to be losers. I don't think there are going to be terribly many winners unless they're the people who back the new energy infrastructure that, that is, is just inevitable. We have to move to that because the costs are growing by the day of the old energy infrastructure and we need to recognise that. It's a very overwhelmingly large task, but the solutions are quite simple. Carbon tax is the way forward. If we raise a billion dollars taxing the polluters, we give a billion dollars tax back as an income tax break to all Australians. No one has anything to fear from that. It's simply making the polluter pay. Very straightforward process. Um, and something that would make an enormous difference. Most Australians would hardly, wouldn't register the sort of shift in their, or any impact from that in their lifestyles. Uh, I think it is, it is a powerless, is a powerlessness is a problem for people. It seems like a very big issue and I just keep reminding myself that people have changed the world before. That you know, My great hero, William Wilberforce, who was the, the, the abolitionist got rid of slavery in Britain. Um, you know, he lived in a world where I guess you know, there was whole colonies that only existed because of slavery and where there was shippers and bankers and, and the ruling class getting richer by the year on the back of a very iniquitous institution. And the average man in the street would never have given slavery a thought and Parliament was so corrupt that it could never um, move to abolish slavery. And yet despite all of that, just by force of his leadership and the, the moral argument that he put forward, we've inherited a world without slavery from Wilberforce. And we know that his moral argument, his moral equation was that it's, it, is, um, it is absolutely wrong to degrade some individuals to enrich others. That's why slavery is wrong. And today we know that it's absolutely wrong to degrade our children's future to enrich ourselves. It's the same moral equation. It's a very, very powerful one and it should move people to act. Australia is without doubt the most backward nation on the planet in terms of addressing this issue. Even the US, which has been a slumbering giant up till now, is starting to awake to this issue. The quality of the debate in Australia is appallingly bad. There is no political leadership from either party and industry is too timid to come forward and state what they know to be the case. So uh, I'm finding it really difficult here uh, in comparison with the rest of the world. I think Australians, by exerting moral leadership, can make a really big difference. Of course, the little bit we contribute by buying a solar hot water system or a hybrid fuel car or whatever is a small bit in the global picture. But what we're saying to the manufacturers when we do that and to politicians when we take that message on is that we're willing to change to leave our children a better future. And the question that we should ask our manufacturers and our political leaders is what are you willing to do to ensure the same thing? I think the WWF is uh, doing a great thing launching this new campaign because uh, you know it, community leadership is just so critically important and to start building that community leadership is the key to success. 
Um, you know, we are on the brink of change, I think, in Australia. We're on the brink of getting a better debate and seeing some action. But that will only come about by committed individuals uh, living their life as testimony to what needs to be done.